everyone, and welcome to today's session, Trade and Environment, an inescapable link to global sustainability. My name is Christopher Gleedle, and I am the CEO of the Paddy Ashdown Forum, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Thank you all for taking the time out and being here today. I would like to thank Pablo Elvedin of GPS for organizing today's webinar. GPS is a network of private institutions and experts from the agribusiness sector from Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay and Uruguay, seeking to contribute to the integration of the Southern Cone countries and their international projection. The Paddy Ashdown Forum is a think tank that is internationalist in outlook with a strong environmental component to produce new thinking on European and international issues. Paddy Ashton Forum are associate members of the European Liberal Forum. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the Paddy Ashton Forum and GPS websites. We would love to hear from you, so do please ask questions and pop your questions into the chat section. Today's webinar is the third of an initial series of eight where we explore the general topic of sustainable agriculture, climate change and trade. The series involves experts from Latin America and the European Union to discuss how together in partnership we achieve targets of net zero, waste and carbon reductions via harmonised cross-border collaboration to promote sustainable and efficient agri-food systems that must be inherent in any long-term sustainably viable policy. We are fortunate to have two great speakers who are willing to share their deep knowledge and understanding on today's topic. First, we have Dr. Martin Enrique Pañero. Martin is an agronomist from the University of Buenos Aires, Master of Science, Agronomy, Iowa State University and PhD in Agricultural Economics, University of California. Presently, Martin is Director of the Committee of Agriculture of the Argentine Council of International Relations, member of the GPS Network, Special Advisor to Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO's Director General and Special Advisor to the Director General of the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture, formerly Under Secretary for Agriculture, Argentina, Director General of the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, amongst many other achievements. And Martin has published 10 books and more than 100 papers about agricultural development, policies and institutional development, food security and on international agriculture and trade. Second, our eminent speaker is Professor Susan Martin Cesar de Oliveira. Susan is a professor at the University of Brasilia in the courses of Agribusiness Management and Environmental Management, Senior Researcher at the Centre for Advanced Studies in Government and Public Administration, and until last month, Head of the Department of Applied Social Sciences and Technology. With a PhD in International Affairs, is a former visiting scholar at Columbia University and at the Department of Law and International Affairs, University of Granada and is a former consultant for White and Case LLP, both in Brussels and in Washington, in the area of international trade, regional integration and trade regulations. Susan has published several articles and books in the area of international political economy, international trade, global value chains, regional integration, foreign trade policy, and science, technology, and innovation policies. So without further ado, I would like to hand you over to our first speaker, Dr. Martin Pinheiro. And I will just bring up your presentation, Martin. Here I go. Okay. Thank you, Christopher, for that very nice presentation. I, first of all, I would like to thank Paddy Ashdown Forum and, of course, GPS for the organization of this uh, meeting. And I'm very honored to have been invited to make a presentation. The, this is the third webinar. The, the series, as you have explained, have dealt mainly with uh, sustainable matters, environmental and sustainable production systems. 
this meeting and I will address mainly or organize my, uh, focalize my address, my presentation in the role of trade in food systems. This implies that sustainability will be present, but there are other dimensions also included in the presentation, as you will see. I have, next please. I have organized my presentation in six themes. In each theme, I will try to arrive to a, a message. So please read them carefully. To the, this is to the audience. Please read carefully these six themes and try to keep them in your mind because the, the, my presentation will be organized in providing some meat, let's say some arguments around these six themes. So my first theme, food systems. And basically that trade, next please, trade is a major component of food systems and has to do with three main dimensions. The efficiency and the capacity of food systems to feed the global population. Secondly, the sustainability aspects, the environmental sustainability aspect. And thirdly, the themes that have to do with nutrition and health. So my main point is to emphasize what is, is obvious and all of you know. Food systems are a very global food systems are a very global complex concept. It's not only farming and agriculture. It has processing, logistics, storage, retail, foods and services. And trade is in between each one of those Places. It can be between farming and processing. It'd be, of course, be with logistics, with storage, between storage and retail food services. So trade is, is, is spread and interlocked in the whole food systems. Now, one observation here I want to emphasize is that farming and agriculture is really a small part estimations in the united states that have statistics on this is that the value of farming represents only 15 percent or about 15 percent of the total expenditures made by consumers so that's a small part so when we talk about food systems we need to talk about the whole picture and of course of the three dimensions i mentioned dimensions i mentioned before and one of the particular things I want to emphasize from the beginning is that the world is organized to deal much more with the farming and agricultural component than with the rest. We have ministers that are farming ministers. We have international organizations like FAO that deal with farming systems. We normally, countries do not have ministers or bodies that deal with the whole food system and there's no international organization that does that in a complete manner so we really have a vacuum there in thinking and in policies so the main thing then and my main the main theme i will try to develop in addition to the say six messages is to say that well, how is trade doing in regards to contributing to the three dimensions that we must take into consideration when we discuss food systems? And I will make some comments on each one of those things. Okay, first, next please. Trade is a major instrument to attain food security globally. If you look at the map, the deep green is countries that export. Uh, let me say first, about 20% of what food consumed is originated in imports. So it's a large, a very large proportion. 
but that proportion is an average worldwide. There are great geographical differences. Countries that can produce more of what they eat and countries that are unable to produce what they eat. So if you look at the map, you have the deep green is the countries that export a lot and the deep brown is the countries that import a lot. And as you can see, there's great geographical differences with the Western Hemisphere being a mainly an exporter. Australia, New Zealand, so Oceania <coughs> as a second major exporter. And then Africa, the Arab countries, China, India, etc., the highly populated countries that are mainly importers and depend on those imports for their food security in much more than 20% of total consumption. So this is what explains trade. Without trade, the importing countries would be unable to feed themselves appropriately. And of course, prices, food prices in those countries would be terribly high. And thus, poor people would be unable to feed themselves. So trade plays a very substantial role in allowing for global food security, not in all countries, but global food security. In addition, next please, trade jointly with technology has allowed for incredible increases in productivity and have allowed the design of the global food systems. If you look at the graph, the, the yellow line is food prices in real terms. You can see that they were going down and then they started growing at the beginning of this century when Southeast Asia and especially China erupted in the market with and created a new imbalance between demand and supply at the international level. But then trade has a magnificent contribution to allow to have one international price and not different prices, very low in production, highly producing countries and very high in deficit countries. And at the same time, relatively stable and that is a major contribution also to global food security. So that for trade as an instrument for food security. Second dimension, sustainability. Environmental sustainability. That has been dealt in the previous two seminars so I do not want to go into detail because it has been covered and I have very little time here for my other points. Just, <clears throat> just let me read a conclusion by Marcelo Regunaga in the first seminar, which is a summary of the discussions we had in the first two webinars. A smooth world food trading system is a major objective and is aimed at facilitating at the same time food security, natural resource sustainability, and mitigating food warming. And that statement is based on the basis that some countries and some ecosystems are more productive, are able to produce with a lower carbon emissions per unit product, and thus trade contributes to lowering the total emissions at the global level. The trade between the low emission countries or agroecosystems to the high consumption, high carbon emission agrosystems. So now thirdly, my, the third dimension, health and nutrition as a growing concern. Nutrition has been in the discussions for the last 10 years. And some progress has been made on that. 
the concerns about obesity or overweight, as you know, there are about 1 billion people which do not eat uh, sufficiently, but there are more than 1, mil 1 billion that don't eat correctly from a nutritional point of view. One of the big things that have emerged from there is labeling. But labeling is not organized by in, in any global sense. And that is a danger because labeling, which is done independently and in a different manner, manner by each importing country, will or could become a trade barrier, a non-tariff, of course, trade barrier for small firms that would need to label their products in a different way to, for each importing country. So there's a need to homogenize that. Codex Alimentarius, which is a program within the FAO, deals with that, but has dealt with a very, in a very uh, insufficient way. So we need to have some place in the world, global, global institution or global program that tries to homogenize and agree in a general consensus of how labeling should be made. Now, with COVID, there are some questions have been raised about the negative impacts that trade can, food trade could have. This is something that is evolving. I don't think we can get any conclusion for the time being. But let me make four observations on that. First, COVID started in a local market what some people in the west call the farmers market not in not in the international trade system so there's no reason to argue against international trade or to argue in favor of local markets secondly <clears throat> global food trade or food trade at the global level has shown to be shown to be quite resilient to the COVID. As you know, trade uh, of products in general are projected to decrease between 13 and 32 percent in this year. Food trade has decreased only two percent, and there's no evidence that global food systems have created lack of supply. The food security impact that COVID is having is mainly because poor people or some people have lost the capacity to buy. It's a matter of access, of, it's, it's a matter of income achievement and capacity to buy, but not a matter of supply. And food prices at the international level, and mainly the, the commodities that are that are traded, have not had great variations in prices. Not they have not gone up. They have not gone down. They have remained more or less at the same level of pre-COVID. And the third observation is: is health matters will necessarily result in new standards new standards that are needed but that have to be based on scientific evidence so they are not created as trade barriers <clears throat> so we need to be sure that the standards that are developed are reasonable and are based in scientific evidence Of course, it is true that a more interconnected world with more trade is more vulnerable to disease-related matters. So this is something we need to pay great attention and again incorporate it in our discussions, in our thinking, and probably in the architecture 
of the international institutions and rules. Now, my fourth topic is that given the arguments I have presented before, it is obvious that food systems must be reformed. Must be reformed to assure that they have reasonable levels of compliance on the three dimensions I have mentioned before. They need to be effective and productive so that the world can feed poor countries and poor populations at reasonable and stable prices. Food systems need to be environmental sustain sustainable and they need to be absolutely correct and proper from a nutritional point of view and a health point of view. There are now, have, have been presented a number of initiatives and proposals in regard to food systems. It has become a new area of discussion and very properly so. <clears throat> the Green Deal presented by the European Union is probably the most complete and the most balanced. I could say, reading in between lines, that it has a great emphasis in sustainability, much less emphasis in <coughs> efficiency, price-related matters, questions, and also it's weaker on health matters. It deals with nutritional matters, but not health matters. But still, it's something that it was presented before COVID. <clears throat> I am sure it will be reworded to include the three dimensions in a proper balance. My concern is that there are many other things being said. There are other proposals. There are other initiatives. For example, I would like to mention just as an example, there is a recent blog by staff of the International Monetary Fund in which, in my mind, present a view totally unbiased, totally biased, <clears throat> unbalanced on, in, in relation to the three dimensions and in, re, in relation to how primary production should be developed. And let me emphasize here that when I mean balanced, and food systems, I think, should be reformed in a balanced way. When I say a balanced way, I mean that they, they have to be efficient and productive so we can feed the world. They have, be, they have to be sustainable because the world needs to have to attack the problems of climate change. And of course, they have to be also at, attentive to health and nutritional matters. For these, we need to work together. There's no international organization, as I said, that takes care of these matters. And there's no many places in which the world discusses these issues in, a, in, a, in an integral, with an integral perspective. There's some organizations that take care of some parts, as I said, FAO, the CJR system that has presented something now, an initiative on, on food systems, an, an integral perspective of food systems. But the international architecture is very weak. So countries need to work together to develop these initiatives. How am I am doing with time, Chris? You're fine, Martin. Okay, so my last, my final point, something about geopolitics of food trade. Let me say that food trade is some, something which is distributed the world around. Most countries have food trade. They import, they export, or they do both things. 126 countries consider food trade sufficiently important to belong to the Agricultural Committee, the, the Agricultural Committee of the WTO, which is a lot. Uh, next, please. 
<coughs> and this here I show food trade, agro-industrial agro trade flows. As you see, is a big mess. I mean, everybody buys and sells food along the, in, in the world. However, next, there are a few, a very small number of countries that are the main players. If we group the countries as the main net food importers, by net, I mean exports, minus imports, or in this case, imports minus exports. We can see that there are really five, six countries or regions that are the main importers. They import 50% the, of the net imports. China very much, and you can see there the, the, the <clears throat> Strong color is 2018, the light color is 208. So it shows the difference in the, few, in the last few years. China, enormous growth. Japan, very important. United, United Kingdom, or Great Britain. Uh, no, rain, no. United Kingdom. Third, and I'll go back to this, but this is after Brexit, of course. Korea, Hong Kong, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. Those three countries are 50% 50 50 at least of all net import. They are the great players. But I want to emphasize the role of United Kingdom as importer. Next, please. Now, if we do it for the exporters, net exporters, look also the enormous concentration. Mercosur, the largest by far. Australia, New Zealand, important. Now, European Union after Brexit. Canada, Thailand, Indonesia. So five countries again, 50% of net exporters. These are the main players. These are the countries that need to get together, work together, orga and organize global food systems. Because what they do will decide what the world does. Of course, United States is not here because exports and imports are more or less balanced. So United States is not a big exporter. It's not a great big importer but of course if you add both things it's the major player is the country that has the greatest trade participation so united states of course is also in the batch of important players <coughs> so my proposal or my my observation is that Mercosur and the European Union have the possibility, and I would say the responsibility, to work together in two big initiatives. How to reform global food systems and how to protect and reorganize international trade. And let me make here two, two small comments, two short comments. <clears throat> the, the, in regards to, to food systems, Traditionally, European has been and has behaved from a trade perspective as an importer. They have had mainly defensive policies in regards to food trade. This is somehow also recognized in the Green Deal and in the Farm to Fork initiative. 
which is the, the main element here in regards to food. But I think that in the future, the UAE will face a dilemma because after Brexit, it will become, as I showed before, as a net exporter. I'm showing it there in the graph, as a net exporter, they will need to export a lot. So their food systems will have to be competitive. Of course, they need to be sustainable. Of course, they have to be have high standards from a health point of view. But they also need to be competitive to be able to participate in international trade because they will need to do it. So here, Mercosur and the United European Union will have common interests. And of course, the agreement we are we have signed and we will probably implement in the next few months is a magnificent opportunity to discuss in the other pillars, the political and the cooperation pillar, to discuss these matters, looking at the interests of the regions and the needs of the world. Second, the question of the trade environment. As you know, trade is being, has been put into question, international trade in general, globalization, international trade, and food, food trade in particular. Now, Europe has played a very positive role in trying and making proposals to reform multilateral agreement, the multilateral architecture, but preserving the WTO in its major role. I think that the uh, European Union has played a major role and should play, and we need that it plays a major role in the future, as it has been doing. We as Mercosur, I think we are willing and capable to participating in that, that discussion and be and in, in conditions to accompany most of the proposals, as, as we have done actually in WTO uh, through our representatives, in trying to maintain and preserve the major elements of multilateralism, preserving the WTO as a major organization, knowing that it needs to be reformed, but knowing that it needs to be able to perform the main functions they have played in the past. So here we have two great big policy areas in which the world needs that the European Union and Mercosur play together a common role and work together on that. So thank you, Chris. This is my presentation. I have a final uh, uh, thing there with my final remarks, which I don't need to read them. Just, I would like to read the last one. Mercosur and the European Union are natural allies in trade and food systems development and must work together to provide leadership to the world. And this is my main and last message. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you so much for, for giving us your insights on that. Um, I can see that it's provoked um, some, uh, some chat and some questions. And uh, thank you so, so much. That, that really was uh, incredibly insightful. Uh, so what I'd like to do is move over, uh, if Susan would like to um, give her presentation, that would be absolutely marvellous. Thank you, Chris. Um, good afternoon. I, it's a pleasure to participate in this webinar. Thanks to the Patty Ashton Forum and to GPS for the invitation. Um, let me try to share my screen here. Can you see it now? Yep. 
that's great. Okay, perfect. So, marking uh, outline really well uh, the, import the importance for, of trade for the global food system and um, how environment and trade are interconnected. And on my presentation, I will highlight the urgency of climate action while focusing on the post-COVID political economy of trade liberalism. Emphasizing the role of green liberalism um, as a tool for sustainable development, my presentation outlines the implications for the Mercosur EU commercial relationship. Therefore, I would like to cover the following topics. Um, first of all, the political economy of post-COVID trade liberalism and how it is challenged by nationalism and protectionism. Second, we will highlight Mercosur's role in rebuilding an environmentally sustainable trading system. Then we'll take a look on green regulatory coherence and convergence between Mercosur and the EU on agri-food as a way forward in environmental sustainability in this sector. And finally, we'll discuss whether the Mercosur-EU association agreement is Green Deal compatible. Uh, environmental concerns can either be perceived as a bar barrier to trade or as an incentive to trade. Trade can be a tool for sustainable development and environmental resilience as long as policies, regulations and standards are coherent, balanced, fair and based on scientific evidence. One could argue that we are currently in a transition to a new political economy of trade liberalism. From the GATT signature in 1947 to the early 90s, trade liberalism framework was increasingly multilateral. In parallel, in the late 90s, the proliferation of preferential trade agreements and the launching of mega regional uh, agreements with an embedded global value chain approach uh, were the features what are called the network liberalism. The transition to a green liberalism has been accelerated by the pandemic. Although its main aspects were already present in the EU Green Deal launched in late 2019. In this chart, we can see the main features of green liberalism as compared to multilateral liberalism and network liberalism. First of all, um, I would like to point out that green liberalism uh, dissemination process could be done mainly through the negotiation of sectoral agreements on green regulatory coherence and convergence, either through a restructured WTO or within regional agreements or even as standalone agreements. Secondly, the cognitive framework of uh, green liberalism is based on the recognition that trade can be instrumental for environmental sustainability. It poses a challenge, however, to the most, most national, uh, most favored national principle, because there could be preference and improved market access for greener products. Furthermore, the green liberalism relies on a multi-stakeholder decision-making process and multiple actors, including public and private ones involved in, in the spread of this framework. Finally, in this approach, uh, openness could be selective, tailored to facilitate a circular economy. A diversity of actors can engage in the process of globally spreading this green liberalism model with the objective of promoting environmental sustainability in respect to planetary boundaries. The EU has been championing at some extent green liberalism through its Green Deal, the Circular uh, Economy Action Plan, 
and even the farm to fork strategy. Nevertheless, these are current there are current challenges in the international trade system and competing views of how to approach these challenges. Here I write highlight some of these challenges. First of all, there is a clear erosion of the WTO system. There is no real political commitment for WTO reform at this point, in spite of G20 with Tarek. There is a blockage in the dispute settlement system, which has jeopardized the only functioning branch of the organization. And for the last couple of years, uh, trade rules had been created through jurisprudence in the SD rulings instead of through negotiations. Now, unfortunately, not even this route is available for multilateral concertation. Second, uh, the Green Liberalist Framework is also challenged by proponents of an increased post-COVID nationalist and protectionist stance. Geopolitical power shifts are also going to be a major feature of the post-COVID international arena, which will reshape the leadership and possibly lead to an increasingly fragmented global trade governance. Although many analysts foresee globalization, uh, globalization retreat, I argue that there is likely to be a shift in the main characteristics of globalization towards a service-based global integration. Finally, in this uncertain post-COVID world, the green liberalism framework will have to transform environmental concerns into trade enablers instead of trade barriers in order to fight protectionist forces. In this, um, in this context, uh, the Southern countries, they can partner with Europe to rebuild an environmentally sustainable trading system. Although there is not yet a whole of formal approach and a sense of urgency for a green recovery, there are some political initiatives in place in each Mercosur country to incorporate sustainable development, climate resilience and preparedness into trade policies and international trade governance as well. There is mounting pressure to implement policies to facilitate the increase of green trade and green investment flows to help address the existential threat of climate change and environmental degradation. The two regions, furthermore, could champion for the green liberalism, generating shifts in decision makers' mindset. Trade would then be perceived as a vehicle for sustainable development and resilience. The transition to a circular economy in Europe can also foster Mercosur's own transition. And in the multilateral arena, the two regions could intensify the work with WTO informal groups. For instance, the Friends for Action on Sustainable Trade, Trade and Circular Economy Group, in order to propose new paths to sustainability within the WTO framework. Finally, Southern Cone countries could partner with the EU in the green diplomacy rooted in green liberalism framework. In this regard, uh, highlighting the Southern countries' role, I'd like to stress two main roles that Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay could play. First of all, they could champion for a global sustainable food system, and they could promote increased convergence on green agri-food regulations and standards. Taking a look in this first role, championing for an international sustainable food system. Uh, here we can notice that Mercosur already has an outstanding performance in the agriculture sector as far as sustainability is concerned. We can notice here on the environmental performance index, the four countries can act to rebuild sustainable food chains. 
increasing exports of sustainable produce, sustainable soy, meat, cocoa, coffee, and other agri-food products. The EU, on the other hand, can assist Mercosur to design policies to further secure and certify on an environmentally sustainable food production. So Mercosur can fulfill its key role on global food security. Throughout the increased implementation of rastreability, precision agriculture, farm digitalization, um, and the use of big data, Mercosur can secure an environmentally friendly food chain complying with high standards. Finally, Mercosur countries are key agents on global food security and in the global transition to sustainable agri-food systems. And uh, there is here a clear link to the EU, EU farm from farm to fork strategy as well. On the second role as champion for increased convergence on green agri-food um, regulations, I believe that the cooperation between Mercosur and the EU could potentially lead to a race to the top on environmental standards for food, food production, labeling, packaging, and transportation. As long as there is regulatory convergence and coherence, environmental regulations can be perceived as a trade enabler. Consumer environmental awareness and greater demands for green products could also be met through regulatory convergence and standards convergence. In this connection, it's also important to foster public and private partnerships for setting standards that are feasible and won't leave behind small and medium farmers. Regulatory convergence would increase uh, market access for Argent Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay's agri-food products in the EU. And how, how this uh, uh, regulatory convergence could be reached? It could be done multilaterally through the WTO. Uh, nevertheless, taking into account the challenge that the system is currently facing, uh, the Mercosur EU Association Agreement could be the preferential form for this concerted action. However, there is a high level, high level of concern regarding whether the EU and Mercosur have reached a green association agreement. And therefore, I would like to stress here some findings of the sustainability impact assessment um, recent release by the London School of Economics um, report. So they found out that globally, the association agreement is just expected to have a negligible impact on CO2 emissions. And the EU in 2015 contributed to around 9.7% of uh, global um, greenhouse emissions. While Mercosur countries reached about 3.5 altogether, repercussions of the EU Mercosur Association Agreement on land use and deforestation also depend on countries' commitment to preserve the existing regulatory framework that reduced the rate of uh, deforestation related to farming activities. And uh, they also pointed out that Mercosur countries adopt currently on average a cleaner energy mix than EU countries, with the exception of Argentina. Um, although environmental policies in Mercosur countries are less stringent than in the EU, the report found out that they are in line with other countries of similar income levels. And um, the association agreement is also likely to strengthen the parties' commitments in the Paris Agreement. In addition, uh, some of the Mercosur countries already have targets that are deeper than EU's, such as Brazil. 
Finally, the agreement will generate an increase in trade in environmental goods and service and stimulate international cooperation for the development of green technology and the protection of natural resources, including fisheries. Furthermore, uh, the agreement is based on a premise that trade should, should not happen at the expense of the environment and has a chapter on trade and sustainable development. This chapter, it builds upon the EU institutional framework uh, established since the Korea UFTA and um, expanded in, in following trade negotiations, CETA, EU, Vietnam, and Mexico agreements. The chapter has provisions regarding climate change, biodiversity, sustainable management of forests, of fisheries and aquaculture, and of supply chains. The main challenge of this chapter, however, is enforcement, as you know, because it's not binding like the other chapters of the agreement, and it's subject to a specific dis dispute settlement pr procedure. Taking into account this, this sustainability impact uh, assessment, the agreement would not harm Europe's ambition to become the first climate neutral continent, and it would leverage the south, southern countries' capacity to conduct their own transition to a green economy. Um, well, well uh, although this is a really fascinating uh, issue, Unfortunately, uh, our time here is limited, so I would like to stress uh, some final comments. First, uh, the political economy of post-COVID trade liberalism will likely be based on environmental sustainability objectives. A green transi transition could be uh, considered the new normal. Southern countries can play an important role in building a sustainable trading system, particularly in the agri-food sector. Regulatory coherence and convergence are instrumental for security, securing market access while fostering a race to the top in terms of environmental standards and regulations in food production. And finally, the Mercosur-EU Association Agreement can be compatible with the EU Green Deal and could be a, a tool in the EU from farm to fork strategy. There is a lot of food for thought and we could certainly uh, address any, any it further in, in the Q and in, in a section. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, you are mute. You are mute. I am indeed. Yes, I apologise for that. Yeah, Susan. I mean that that was an immensely e in informative presentation, and and, uh, and uh, thank thank you so much. You've you've covered a great deal of uh, information in a very short space of time, um, and that's certainly very much the, uh, greatly appreciated. Um, and it was certainly very interesting to hear the interdependence um, between your comments and and Martin's, and and certainly one of the ones that obviously come across, which is very key to you both is is balance across um, the trading systems but balance across the food systems um, and when sort of viewing food systems and um, in, 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 in the round and sort of particularly picking up on one of Martin's slides obviously you've got some very very powerful actors um, that control um, the trade uh, systems independently though um, that they're trying to control a system that actually has interdependent uh, facets. Um, so you've got shipping and transport, as well as agriculture, you've got the retail end, and of course you've got investors um, um, running, running behind there too. Um, how, do, how do you see creating sort of equilibrium across that system and, and getting very powerful actors um, communicating better 
to actually um, give more balance to the whole system um, so investors can still get a, a good return but reducing price volatilities um, and being able to protect vulnerable populations where food price uh, movement in food prices of course affects them the most do, do, do you have sort of uh, ideas of how to get all the different uh, actors talking together um, to be more effective and more efficient perhaps you could uh, start susan on that one Uh, I think you touched on a really important point here, that's communication. And Martin as well um, raised up this uh, issue, how uh, usually the international organizations and the government really um, take a, a compartmented look on these problems, giving much more attention uh, to farming instead of the other um, the other nodes on the value chain. So um, I think uh, I, uh, it is uh, really important to get all those actors um, talking and better communicating to, uh, um, to uh, uh, deal with this miscommunication problem. Uh, we are currently living in a, a very interconnected world and uh, unfortunately, what we have seen is uh, an increase on the, the sharing of uh, not the best kind of information, a lot of fake news, and uh, um, this is provoking a, a lot of misunderstanding uh, among the community, also not only domestic communities, but also in the international community. So I think this is also related to uh, uh, global governance, how we can try to uh, maybe rebuild the global governance system for farming, for agriculture, and, and also on, on the global governance uh, trade system. But um, I think we can uh, tackle this further. I will leave, uh, uh, I will give Martin also a, a, a chance to, to speak on this um, particular question. Uh, yes, do you hear me well? Yes, Martin. Okay, uh, first of all, let me recall or repeat because I'm, I'm not sure I was quite clear what I meant with balanced. No, with balance means that we need to reform food systems taking into consideration the three dimensions. Not only as we did in the past productivity, not only environmental sustainability as we are concentrating the attention today. There are the three dimensions. Secondly, that what we do, and basic, and especially when we design standards, they should be scientifically based. We should not, we should be very careful in not inventing things because maybe they have to be scientifically based, and that is a traditionally, a historically agreed concept in the trading, trading community. And thirdly, that the three dimensions have trade-offs. We cannot achieve the maximum on the three just like that. <coughs> In the process, there will be trade-offs. And let me use one example. To use, we should be using less chemicals and less pesticides, of course. Now, let's say that we, uh, avoided using fertilizers. Of course, production will go down and prices will go up. So, nothing in the world, in, in life, nothing is just for nothing. So, there are trade offs between these three dimensions. So, that is part of the balance. Now, what is the problem we have today? What Susan was saying. We don't have an institutional architecture to take this subject on board. For one thing, food systems, as I said, 
is not only farming, it's many other things. All those many other things are mainly controlled by large firms. The Nestles, the, uh, all the others. So it is mainly a private sector business. We will not be able to develop uh, appropriate global food systems which are balanced and we will not be able to progress in the right direction unless the private sector is brought on board and is convinced about the need that they behave appropriately. As everybody knows, behavior in the private sector also depends on incentives. And the incentives are the basis of public policy. So we need to get the public policy, the incentives, and the agreement of the private sector on the same board, on board, on the same page. Yes. Now, in some aspects, there are international organizations that do that. If you take just trade rule, well, you have, we have WTO. If we talk about sustainability in the, pri in the primary sector in farming, we have FAO, good or bad, but we have FAO. Now, we don't have anything similar for food systems. We need to create something that fills that void. I don't have a solution for that in this moment in which globalization is going backwards and that the, <clears throat> there's no great conviction about multilateral organizations, it would be impossible to create a new body. And this is why I emphasize that an alliance, something as a green alliance mentioned in the, the Farm to Fork initiative between Mercosur and the U European Union is one possible but also major step in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. You, you. Make some, you make some really important points there. Um, and, and certainly when sort of looking at, at the large industrials um, and, and, and the large companies involved, obviously very deeply in, in, in the trade systems, um, get, getting them on board um, and getting everybody marching to the, to, to, to the same tune. Do you think, again, that comes back to communication? Um, and the lack of clarity around what sustainability is. Um, is do, do you feel that sustainability has many interpretations um, depending on, on, on particular um, perspectives? Um, people look at it as people, planet, profit, but of course each is a function of the other. Um, and that the large companies um, need to have a system of, of actually understanding um, that actually be, being able to function in, in a more productive manner is a function of sustainability and, and productivity around that. So therefore, they, what, what happens is they will change their behavior as they actually realize that uh, um, the uh, productivity um, can actually be improved to actually also help the investors behind that. Um, so if you looked at, a, at standards rather than regulation, um, to maybe make uh, boards more enlightened um, in, in, into um, the, their behavior roles within the trade systems. What would your thoughts be to that? Susan, you go first. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, Martin. Um, so, I think there is uh, clearly a, a lack of consensus regarding what sustainability actually means. Uh, on the other hand, there is, uh, we can see in the literature a consensus regarding what uh, sustainable development means. So um, we need to bring into discussion as well uh, um, what we have in common so this understanding on, on sustainable development is important to to um, so we can base our discussions on 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 this uh, concept and um, I, I think that while we, we have in mind some common 
grounds also on sustainability, taking into account that it should uh, bring into the table also economic sustainability, uh, social sustainability, and uh, the, the, the fact that we can uh, currently uh, use the material resources in, in a way that we will not trump the future generation's ability to access those resources and we are all uh, respecting the planetary boundaries. So I think uh, our, this is why I, I highlight um, the, and, and, and stress the importance of good regulations. And when I mean, when I, I talk about regulations, I, I, I I mean uh, good uh, policies and these uh, policies that are encompassing and, and balanced, as Martin said, these could uh, generate um, good standards, high standards. I think regulations are mostly uh, the, the, the common ground, I guess, the, the, the baseline. So standards always try to to move a little up on the on the baseline, and um, so when we establish uh, good regulations, it's a step towards uh, high standards, I, I I would think. But I I have also tend to see that um, there is a a, a, need, a need for more. Um, for more harmonization between private standards and um, public standards or regulations because the food chain it's uh, really uh, it's currently really uh, governed by private standards as Martin pointed out how the large uh, companies are being the leaders of um, the food chain Food, food global value chains. So how we can deal with these multiple private standards, uh, which can actually um, be barriers to trade sometimes, especially for small um, family farmers or small producers uh, that they, they uh, can't, um, implement all the necessary steps to meet these standards. So uh, I think there comes the, the regulations, there comes the government to try to balance uh, the system a little bit more and try to make it more equitable and fair also to the, the small uh, producer. And so it won't be uh, excluded from the, the global value chain. Um, so this is how I, I, I see the, the interconnection between regulations, private and public um, standards, but there is a lot to work on these issues. We, we, there is a lot to be improved and it's really uh, um, something, I, for me, it's a, a, a a very key point when we discuss um, market access, even in the Mercosur EU agreement, I think this is paramount that we uh, develop mechanisms for uh, harmonization or at least uh, convergence and, and cooperation between the two regions in, in, in order to establish um, common uh, regulations so we can sort of uh, level the playing field and try to to also change the mindset so the the decision makers and even uh, all the other stakeholders they can take a new look into uh, the link environment and uh, and trade like perceiving uh, uh, that this new uh, approach, the what I call the green liberalism, could actually uh, be an opportunity uh, instead of a barrier. Yeah, 
yeah no again you 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 make uh, great 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 points and uh and uh and look looking at obviously the ma the major sort of uh actors cause sort of con controlling the trade um and uh and i mean and obviously investment flows and i know you mentioned uh, you talked about investment flows um so look looking at um uh, areas such as uh, uh, greater communication. Do you think there's also maybe also an area to help that communication, but maybe some new um, metrics are actually needed to be able to uh, to uh, model and actually report on on um, emissions and impact, um, because th there's a lot that there's often um, um, ways of being able to uh, project reporting that might that, that can be sometimes um, attuned to actually give a, an overall message but actually they could actually be making something worse um, particularly around greenhouse gas measurements um, that, that's a particularly um, um, area of tension um, and do, do you think so, so say for example but from an investor point of view or a major um, corporation point of view if for example within projects and developments and, and, and trade that if something like an environmental return on investment could be deeply integrated into the financial metrics um, and, and uh, which also of course would have a, a, a social impact um, in there and, those, and numbers were actually given do you think that would help um, um, inform policy and standards? Uh, uh, certainly, I, I think that, um, in, I think we are actually moving towards this, uh, the establishment of new metrics in, for investments, uh, mainly. Um, we can see that uh, uh, there are many investment funds that are moving to uh, what they call the ESG uh, uh, funds. So I think uh, this can be a new trend, actually. And um, but I, I, I think that there is a, a, the key here is actually the financial financial incentive it's not even only the sustainability or the the social and governance uh, um, uh, incentive because these fun funds they have really performed well um, lately and they they like the investors that are concerned with the environment and sust sustainability they are not um, actually sacrificing uh, financial returns. Mm. They are really getting what they, they want from their investments. And uh, um, so I think this is actually going to be a new trend uh, and it will, ex it will be expanded because uh, those sort of funds, they are... Um, they are also giving an incentive for government to to implement uh, and uh, monitor their um, regulations and we we start to see this happen here in brazil a lot of pressure from investors um in, into the uh, the government so i think we are seeing a, a little movement on this and and the trends that this is going to to be expanded yeah yeah um so because one, one of the things that seems to certainly come across and again a question to to to, to both of you if, if i may is that also you see there's a you you look at a lot of indices and there's a there's a general decline in trust in governments and large corporations from 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 the people of the world um and if we if we looked at uh, being able to um, set, be part of the journey of creating com more comparable audited and trusted information um, that people can rely upon, um, 
do you feel that would get engaged and, and going back to the, some points made earlier uh, by, by Martin, get people and, and organizations more engaged and trusting in the process of the Paris, of things like the Paris Agreement because they can act because reported um, outcomes are now absolutely reliable and absolutely comparable so they can see that they're actually on a level playing field and everybody's marching to the same tune. Um, that, that thought to both of you, please. Yeah, sure. A short answer to a difficult question, Christopher. The lack of confidence on governments and international organizations is a disease the world has gotten recent, um, relatively recently, and we have to fight back. Uh, we need to regain that, and as you say, this implies a lot with how governments and organizations should behave. But in spite of that confidence, there's a lot of things that we need to do, as Susan was saying, in regards to getting, and you were saying, in regards to getting better data, better standards, better indexes. And that's the work that the, the academic world and some of the organizations need to do. There's a lot of, of information in regards to sustainability that is incorrect or uh, incomplete and probably incorrect in some cases. So of course we need to change it because on, on the basis of that incorrect figures or data, people have construed conclusions in regards to emissions and who emits and who doesn't emit and how much that are incorrect, that are incorrect. So we need to fix that. Now, this particular uh, theme requires the collaboration of governments and the private sector. Because the private sector is the one that finally does things in, in primary production and in the rest of the, of the chain. And if you think, for example, in finances, you know, finances are discussed globally. You have the G20 that really pays attention to that. And you have all the groups that uh, get the bankers together that discuss things. And the world is able to instrument financial policies that are coordinated. Now, on food systems, there's nothing comparable to that. And we need to const construct something similar. We need to construct a place where food systems are discussed. Until now, food was considered sort of a minor thing and something that was mainly decided at the country level. With trade and with globalization and with COVID, it is clear that it's a global thing. It's a global matter that needs to be discussed and, and resolved or attacked in a, in a coordinated way globally. And we have no way to do it. So maybe we need to organize another seminar to discuss that specific point. I think that sounds like a great idea. Um, do you, do, we're, we're, we're running close to time. Would, do, you, do you want to add, add anything to uh, Martin's great observations there, Susan? I agree with Martin. I think um, what we are lacking is a better um, what we can call um, a global governance on, on the food system, as I already mentioned. We have uh, actually currently a fragmented um, global governance. Mm -hmm. This uh, may be because um, it's such a complex uh, system that we can't reach uh, a, 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 a very uh, united or monolithic uh, global governance on this issue. So fragmentation cannot necessarily be negative, but the, the various um, fragmented uh, uh, locus of decision or of uh, leadership, they need to um, collaborate and work better together in, in order to reach a common uh, objective or to produce this confidence that's lacking. So we need to maybe regain 
this uh, um, confidence from uh, uh, consumers or voters or, on government and the capacity to uh, deal with this uh, complex problem that is uh, um, the, the sustainability of the food system and uh, it's a really uh, um, it's a really uh, complex issue so yeah, actually we we won't be able to give a perfect solution here but we we could um, try to, to establish uh, some key points on, on how to move forward on constructing, on building this um, regained confidence on the, on the capacity of governments, organizations to create some, uh, um, some common ground or some sort of consensus or guidance at least on how we move forward on this uh, uh, complex uh, problem. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, it is a complex uh, um, issue um, and fragmentation in governance could be underpinned by fragmentation between specialisms and, and, uh, and obviously um, impacts falling into the knowledge gaps. But that's for another day. Um, as Martin said, we, we, the, today has been absolutely wonderful, um, and uh, wow, what a conversation. Um, but unfortunately, the chariot of time has caught up with us, and so we're having to draw to a close. Um, and uh, the conversation has been extremely exciting and insightful, um, and it's been a privilege to um, um, have you on today, Martin and Susan. Uh, thank you so much for your outstanding contribution and deep insights into the complexity of, uh, of sustainably viable food systems, but giving us some hope and, light and, and putting some light on the road ahead for the development of the EU-Mercosur agreement in the context of the EU New Green Deal. Um, so I would also like to thank you uh, on behalf of obviously GPS. Um, and uh, also, obviously, uh, I'd like to thank Horacio Sanchez Cabrero, for the chair of GPS. And I know that uh, the, uh, Robert Woodthorpe Brown, the chair of the Paddy Ashtown Forum, if he were able to join us today, I know he'd like to pass on his thanks to you. And on behalf of our guests who are, who are viewing this today, I would also like to pass on their thanks. Um, our next webinar is next Wednesday at the same time, where once again we'll have some great speakers um, around the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Argentina. Uh, so everybody do look out for the notices to register or make contact directly to ensure you don't miss out. Um, but until then, I hope you all keep safe and uh, we very much look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much. Thanks to you, Christopher, for a very good sharing. Thank you.